Okay. Uh, we'll next go to Adrian Fisher. Hear me? Hear me? Yes. Hello? Is this um, Adrian Fisher? Yes. Okay. Um, my name is Adrian Fisher. I'm a sustainability coordinator by profession. I'm a restoration volunteer in the Cook County Forest Preserve District uh, in Illinois. I'm a master gardener, uh, and I also write and speak about native bee conservation for gardeners, and I'm also a licensed pesticide applicator in the state of Illinois. Um, my point is that I, I want to share an observation. I live in an old urban neighborhood, and my backyard is full of multiple species of native bees. When I go to visit friends in central Illinois in farming country, I have actually gone on um, walkabouts and have found few to no native bees. In the morning, in my yard, there would be hundreds of different kinds of native bees, and in the afternoon in central Illinois, zero. Okay, I'm not going to talk about um, pesticides, although as an applicator, I have extremely um, high respect and do not think they should be used, uh, particularly in the ways that I have been seeing them used um, personally. To get to more a more positive point, um, first of all, the best best methods to reduce exposure to pesticides for pollinators is to reduce the use of pesticides. Period. Secondly. I believe that partnerships are very val valuable, and particularly in urban and suburban areas. You could partner with homeowners associations, for example, to promote the use of um, native plants and to um, uh, tell people that to use native plants and not pesticides and to reduce their lawns. You could educate lawn care agencies as well. You could partner with municipal park districts. You could partner with wild ones. You could partner with, um, in the Chicago area, Chicago Wilderness. They have an, ex an extensive network of um, contacts and they represent 360 um, organizations. There are many, many ways to uh, help our native pollinators who don't get the kind of um, uh, notice that that the honeybees do. However, they are much more efficient pollinators of many kinds of plants, including squash and tomatoes. So I just want to throw that out there and suggest also that in our uh, agricultural areas, we could promote the use of hedgerows, we could end fence line to fence line farming, we could um, along our roadways in increase pollinator uh, conservation areas and conser pollinator conservation areas, especially for native pollinators, include trees and shrubs and grasses and forbs. And so these are all kinds of habitats that should be promoted and can be promoted in the suburbs as well as in agricultural areas. So thank you very much for your time, and I appreciate the um, opportunity to make a comment. Thank you. Um, we're going to circle back to Richard Andrews. Yes, am I on the line now? You are. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you for having this session. Uh, I'm sorry it was so dominated by the advertisements in the early stages. Uh, my comments have to do with the processes the EPA uses in registering pesticides. Uh, pesticides are a major problem, not only insecticides, but herbicides. Herbicides are dominating the loss of habitat, in fact, and those need to be cut back on tremendously, or else we were just not going to make progress. Regarding the insecticides and fungicides and others that are also deadly to our pollinators, uh, one of the processes that EPA uses is the conditional registration. It is being used and has been used for a couple of decades now inappropriately and not for its original intended purpose. I call upon EPA to stop using conditional registration. 
for those pesticides that were conditionally registered that are causing the toxicity and pollinator toxicity, I would call upon you to, in fact, enforce the conditions, which, you do, which EPA does not do. Most of these conditional registrations have never met the conditions that were applied to them. I, I, would, I would also call upon EPA to, in fact, begin to use valid science. Science, as used in the risk assessments, is deeply flawed. Even the EPA scientists themselves say so and have written so in public scientific conferences. The methodology of, of focusing almost entirely on acute toxicity measures of adult bees does not look into chronic sublethal effects, does not look into full life cycle effects. All of those things need to be done, done properly and with good scientific method, which EPA does not account for. I call upon EPA to become a scientific agency. I call upon EPA to honor the middle word in its own name, and that is protection. Uh, they are not doing these things. I'm speaking as a former EPA employee myself. And when, in the early days of EPA, that it actually did its job, I call upon you to return to your mandate. I also, one more thing I will add, I, I could speak for hours on this, is EPA does not test what is actually being applied. They only look at the active ingredient. They must redo their entire process to use as applied and as mixture formula to assess toxicity. That is an essential element. I, I will stop now. No, I know I have tons more to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, to aid all of us in hearing, what we're going to do now is we're going to do a global mute on all of the uh, telephone lines. And then when you're called upon to speak, um, I believe you hit pound six. So for right now, we're going to mute all of the lines. We're going to go to folks back here in the room. And then when we start the next line of ro roll of people um, participating online, we'll go that method. So, okay. I'm Dave Packenberg. Eight years ago next week, I wouldn't have found what I found. We all wouldn't be sitting here having this meeting. I've been keeping bees for 50 years. We're here talking about pollinator health today, and most of the folks I've heard about that already spoke didn't really have much talk about pollinator health. Jay, I was really interested in your comments about bear's mite, and you're exactly right. That's a big mite. But Varroa showed up in the 1980s, and I can tell you all about Varroa. I've been keeping bees for 50 years. I know about foul brood, tracheal mites, Varroa mites, viruses. I've seen it all. 20 years after the mite showed up, we found CCD. So to say that mites are the problem, uh, mites are still a problem. Mites will always be a problem around the world, but mites are not what's causing their problem. And so we decide to start looking at other things and why the mites are causing us more problems than they have in the past. Uh, we're not going to get to the bottom of this. Another comment that you made, Jay, and somebody else made about Australia and New Zealand. Well, I'd give you a ticket. I'll buy you a ticket to go down to Australia and New Zealand and visit beekeepers. And not to talk to your own people down there, but go visit some beekeepers. And I can take you to people in New Zealand and Australia. It'll show you the same symptoms we have here of colony health and CCD. Somebody else brought up the word, talked about bee management. Myself, been a beekeeper 50 years. And I know I'm getting old and decrepit, but I know I haven't forgot all I knew that I've learned in that 50 years. I don't have a lot of doctors' names behind, doctors behind my name, but I've got a lot of experience in the field, and I know what's going on out there. I don't know why for sure, but I can, I can tell you when I put bees in an agriculture area around certain things, what happens. I stay put bees in non-agriculture areas. I got healthy colonies, and this is what we're seeing across the country. Several weeks ago, you Folks, we had meetings here with, and talked about pasture. We need good bee pasture. The federal government needs to open up their land. The bee industry met with BLM and the Forestry Department, and their answer was the president's not going to tell us what to do. So I don't know if there are any of them people in the room or any people listening on the phone, but we need good, clean bee pasture. Good, clean bee pasture 
we talk about going out here and, and, and doing plantings and all this money we're going to spend on plantings. Well, when you're planting seed on land that's already been contaminated, you're not really solving the problem. And the EPA, I, I passed out the, from the American Beekeeping Federation, the American Honey Producers, our bullet points of what we think needs to be done. The EPA, you know, we do need better testing. We need better labeling. You know, I sat on the committee with PPDC for a number of years, and we talked about labeling, which became to no avail. We've got to look at applied, the applied product and not what you're looking at. We've got to have, you know, I'm a farmer, too. I own two farms besides being a beekeeper. We need pesticides to farm, but we need responsible pesticides. As a beekeeper, I need, a, I need pesticides, but I need to be responsible, and that's what we need. We all need to go back to responsible pesticides. Somehow, there's a lack of communication between the manufacturers, the PCAs out in the field. Like one of my friends who one of the major chemical companies told me one day, you know, the PCAs are basically the drug pushers of the chemicals. As a farmer, I can, I can vouch for that fact. We've got to look at tank mix. We've got to look at additive. All these things have got to be taken a look at. And until we do, I mean, the, the, the products that we have out there as chemicals as a farmer, the minute I put an additive with it or, or mix it a tank mix, it, it changes it completely. So, you know, you folks at EPA, you know, I told you this. We, you know, we're having this listening session today. I really wasn't even going to come here because you guys have been listening to me for eight years. And I want results is what, I mean, the bee industry wants results. We're still losing bees. The question was asked me by the EPA people here in this room today or is a loss. How's the losses? Well, I'll tell you more about it in January and February. But I can tell you that the, the, the losses are already mounting this fall. And uh, I don't know when, when somebody's going to step up to the plate. And uh, like, like some of the people on the, conference, on the conference call, some of the comments they made, take some of these things to heart. Uh, you know, I'm, we've had you folks out to California to look at what's going on out there in the field. We, Jim was, Jones was out in South Dakota this summer to see what was going on. I don't know whether... You didn't see what you've seen, but uh, we're losing beekeepers and we're losing bees. And uh, it's, it's not only financial loss, it's a mental situation. And uh, I know the chemical companies and all those people, they, they want you to do your darndest to, to not go after them, but they wouldn't be sitting here in this room today if they weren't protecting their interests. And uh, think about your job. Like the gentleman said a while ago, your part of your job is protection of the environment. And so let's remember what your job is. Okay, are there any other comments in the room before we go back to folks online? Okay, um, the woman sitting next to Cynthia, I'm sorry, I don't know your name. Hi, I'm Tiffany Fink Haynes, and I work with the organization Friends of the Earth. And I'm here on behalf of our over 600,000 members and supporters. And like Cynthia and, and Peter said, we really want to communicate our appreciation for EPA's recent release of its analysis of the benefits uh, of neonic or neonicotinoid seed treatments, which confirmed that neonicotinoid seed treatments offer little or no increase in economic benefit to U.S. soybean production. And we'd also like to communicate the urgent need for EPA to take the following steps. First, we'd like EPA to suspend the registration of neonicotinoids for agricultural uses, including seed treatments, as well as cosmetic and other unnecessary uses pending the results of pesticide reevaluation. We'd like EPA to prioritize the systemic insecticides for registration review starting now in 2014 and ensure inclusion of independent peer-reviewed research on the acute and chronic effects of systemic insecticides on pollinators. We'd like EPA to expedite the development and implementation of valid test guidelines for sublethal effects of pesticides on pollinators and require data from the studies of all currently registered and any new pesticides. We'd also like EPA to require a strong and effective bee hazard statement on the label of all products containing systemic insecticides toxic to pollinators, including but not limited to soil applied pesticides, bags of coated seeds, and spoiler use products. And finally, we want to applaud the CEQ guidelines that were recently released, but we'd like to see those guidelines be a requirement for all federal agencies and on all federal land. Thanks for your time and taking these, making these items a priority. 
All right, Tom Van Arsdale. Well, good afternoon. I'm Tom Van Arsdale. I'm director, director of public affairs with the Pollinator Partnership. Uh, the word partnership in our organization is how we try to do most of our business. We encourage and foster partnerships and collaboration. Uh, the federal agencies, many of them are quite familiar with this through our facilitating the North American Pollinator Protection Campaign, which is a public-private tri-national collaboration, uh, which focuses on the art of the possible, trying to find common ground, self-selecting projects to make things better, and then going outside the tent and fighting with each other, which is what we're paid to, be, to do in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have a number of things that uh, we're pleased to offer in support of moving the needle through the presidential memorandum and its vision. Uh, you're familiar with many of them. Uh, continuing education for pesticide applicators is one that we would like to get out on the landscape for those who are applicators uh, because the bottom line in terms of moving the needle is changing behavior. Whether you're talking about forage or you're talking about safer use of crop protection tool, it's changing behavior, making people aware and changing behavior. We have a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, curriculum that we're hoping uh, to get out in the landscape of uh, working with the State Department's agriculture industry and others, reaching those who are using the pesticides so that they're aware of how to at least reduce exposures and risks. Uh, we have something called Business for Bees, where uh, largely non-agricultural companies have come together, committed to engage in supporting the presidential memorandum in, in three ways, managing their own landscapes, uh, particularly in terms of providing forage and habitat for honeybees and native pollinators, and engaging their employees and their customers and encouraging them to take some more actions. We have a, uh, a business, a, a share program. As, as we look at this issue when it comes to forage and landscape, as humans, when we appropriate landscapes, we tend to use them and not share them with anybody else. And the endangered species solution is we have to give up those landscapes. I think on, when it comes to pollinator habitat and forage and providing safe forage, it's sharing our landscapes while we still use it to grow our food and to live and work and move and play around, not in an x-ray depression. A couple of, of feedbacks in terms of the process to date that I, I'd like to offer. Uh, the, the issue of native versus non-native plantings for honeybees and native pollinators, uh, particularly when it comes to honeybee forage, certainly the pollinator partnership, our focus is on out outcomes, what's the quality, and adequacy of the nutrition and, and forage that's being planted. Uh, so we're not wed to natives only, and we hope that those making decisions, while maybe natives only in some circumstances, it doesn't have to be because that impacts on cost and availability and people actually taking action to plan for pollinators. On the federal facilities guidelines, just a couple of questions that occurred to me. Uh, how much input was received from the, uh, the, the seed and plant providers in, out in the community? Uh, in terms of uh, how well the guidelines might work when they're actually implemented, including issues like cost and availability and whether uh, the, the, the seeds that might be selected are actually going to be effective, uh, provide effective forage and nutrition for uh, pollinators. Uh, in terms of uh, honeybees, part of the lead part of the presidential memorandum, uh, do those guidelines encourage beekeeper access, for example? We have beehives at the White House Garden. We have beehives on top of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, has that been considered in those guidelines? In terms of uh, public lands agencies, understandably a lot of their focus is on pre preserving natural habitats and wildlife. Uh, when it comes to a large percentage of U.S. landscapes that they manage and influence, uh, I would encourage the federal agencies with those charges to think creatively about the use of public lands to provide that safe, clean forage for honeybees where appropriate, consistent with sound science. Uh, hopefully we can avoid the battles uh, of precautionary principle. Let's not allow them until we have all the answers. There ought to be some middle grounds on some of those landscapes because it's going to take a, a, a landscape-wide solution, including public lands. Involve the beekeepers and their relationships with landowners, they know where a lot of the opportunities are. They know where the issues are. They have relationships. With those. They have the experience that you just heard uh, expressed by uh, one, one, one individual in that area. An issue that has come up uh, when, in working with businesses, what about the liability issue? If we encourage uh, bees onto our landscapes, 
uh, our attorneys are telling us we can't do that. And I would hope that uh, through a public-private partnership, we can work out appropriate remedies so that that doesn't become an insurmountable, ob insurmountable obstacle in this litigated society. And so that's a practical uh, barrier that hopefully that we can overcome. And finally, uh, I know one of the challenges is truly forging effective partnerships where we leverage limited resources. Partnerships across agencies, which I see in, in, happening in this process, which I'm encouraging about, process uh, partnerships between agencies and private sector partners, and then private sector partnerships. So we're working with the seed industry and others to try to forge a supporting collaborative effort in the private sector and ready to plug into the, the federal agencies where it makes sense. Thank you. Okay, why don't we go back to the line. Uh, the next person, let me go back to Brian Aya, E-Y-A. Um, if you have a comment, please press pound six. Okay, um, Sarah Red Laird. If you hit pound six, you should be able to speak. Um, Brian Toller. I'm here. Okay, hear me? go ahead, Mr. Toller. Great, thank you. Uh, this has been quite the adventure. I know y'all are trying to get a lot of interest together on uh, using the web. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Is there a way to speak more loudly? Well, I'm, I'm speaking as loudly as I can. Is that still okay? You're just fading in and out. Sorry. All right. Well, I've been accused of that. Um, <laughs> for the opportunity. Um, well, I, I appreciate y'all putting the webinar together. I wish it had functioned a lot better. I know the comments on the on the webinar itself expressed a lot of dissatisfaction. But anyway, we are where we are. I'm, I'm perplexed by the comments that have come from some of the speakers today because this isn't. I didn't think a debate about neonics. Uh, this is a broader issue about pollinator health. And pollinator health is not tied to the use or non-use of neonics. That is turned into a, a mantra that's being pushed by a small group of people, usually in a university setting, trying to victimize the pollinators. Well, farmers and pollinators have been working together for a long time. We need the beekeepers to provide pollinators or farming isn't sustainable. So let's just get that out front and be clear about it. We all have a concern about colony collapse disorder. We have concerns that are multiple issues that contribute to colony collapse disorder. Jay Brown stated very clearly, the very first speaker, about the impact of the varroa mites. We can't ignore the impact of a varroa mite, and we need to work together to get solid controls. We also know that the neonics do play a vital role in agricultural production. We can talk about a study that says that they believe that there's no direct impact for farmers. Well, there's a lot of other studies, and there's a lot of farmers that will tell you otherwise. So let's not go off what a study says. Let's go off what agriculture production tells us. Decades of production, trying to come up with new chemistries to fight new pests and do it in a way that's safer for the environment. Neonics do that, and we should applaud that effort. I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Again, my name is Brian Toller with the Georgia Agribusiness Council, and we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to circle back to Sarah Red Laird. Sarah, she said online she was trying to speak. I don't. Know. Hi. Yeah, I can. I can hear you guys just fine. Can you hear me? Okay, we can hear you now. Thank you. Okay, awesome. Um, this is Sarah Red Laird. I um, run a nonprofit organization called the Bee Girl Organization, and I'm also the um, organ outreach coordinator for the Bee Friendly Farming Initiative. And so um, I'm a beekeeper myself, and I also work with farmers and. Uh, wine grape growers to um, plant for pollinators and um, more specifically honeybees. Um, and what I under 
stand that has been kind of coming out of the work of the task force um, and the announcements of the forage meeting last month was that the majority of the um, money for honeybee forage is going to be um, passed down through the NRCS and um, more specifically through the ECOIC program. But I know that the farmers that I work with and a lot of the land managers that I work with don't qualify for ECOIC programs. And so what I would like to ask for is considering um, moving some of that money and some of the focus away from the NRCS and away from the EQIP programs, which tend to be um, very focused on native species and native plants and flowers, which are awesome. But there's a lot of plants and flowers that are out there that are outside of the realms of what is considered a quote unquote native. Um, and our bees need those flowers for food, um, for nectar and pollen, and they need um, trees that might necessarily not be native trees for making the propolis. And then I would also um, ask while you're doing that to just um, take a look at some of the other smaller nonprofits that are out there with their boots on the ground doing good work and have great relationships with farmers and growers and can really make a difference. And that is all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, next person we have is, I think we just have a screen handle, Al Rue. I apologize. This is Jim LaRue. Uh, my spelling is atrocious. Anyway, we've gotten much more on topic, much more happy with what is going on now, especially the last couple of speakers. I'm sorry. We're, I'm sorry to interrupt you. We're having a very difficult time hearing you. Okay. I appreciate that we're back on topic. Um, one of the major things I'm hearing is we're still not getting to task we're all worrying about our own individual little entities and not working together. Uh, personally, I think R&D, I love some of the comments from the last lady as far as uh, the use of the forage monies maybe going someplace else. Uh, but just hopefully that we can start working as a group in trying to find the solutions, which is a whole lot of things beyond just attacking one different entity. Uh, one entity. Um, we're dropping the ball here. We're we're so worried about pointing fingers, we're not getting the job done. And uh, I thank you for your time, and that's about it for my comments. Right, thank you. Uh, one more online, uh, Lex Haran. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So my name is Lex Haran. I work with Pesticide Action Network in our office in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And then I work with different beekeepers and farmers and rural communities across the Midwest. Um, and I won't add a lot based on what others have already said, but I do want to applaud EPA and USDA for creating these opportunities for public comment and also echo what we heard earlier that it would be great to see more listening sections take place with enough notice to bring in all of the different stakeholders who would be interested. And I just want to highlight um, particularly one resource that, that has been particularly important in the last year which is the Worldwide Integrated Assessment, which is a scientific review that came out earlier this year, published by the Global Task Force on Systemic Insecticides. Um, this, is, this review included 29 independent scientists reviewing more than 800 studies that have come out in the last five years on systemic insecticides. And the task force found that present day levels of use of systemic insecticides being used according to label at field realistic rates are likely to have a wide range of negative impacts on pollinators and entire ecosystems. And that worldwide integrated assessment went on to say that the present scale of use of neonicotinoids and fipronil is not a sustainable pest management approach. So I think the breadth of this review is really significant. Um, the science is clearly showing that these systemic pesticides are lethal to pollinators, even at low doses, disrupting critical brain functions and reducing their immunity to common pathogens. And so I want to point to one problem in particular, I think, that hasn't been highlighted yet today that we'd be interested to see EPA take on, which is around the classification of uh, neonicotinoid-treated seeds, those treated seeds currently being classified as treated articles. And we'd like to urge EPA to end this loophole in federal pesticide policy that classifies those seeds as treated articles as opposed to pesticide applications. Um, instead, we'd recommend that EPA should bring those pesticide-coated seeds under regulation and require label warnings and use directions on seed bags 
in order to minimize pollinator exposure, since this is a major route of exposure to neonate pesticides. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you. Uh, we'll go back to the room. Is there anyone else in the room? Uh, Nichelle, Harriet? Hi, good day. Thank you, EPA, for having this session. My name is Nichelle Harriet. I am with Beyond Pesticides, a not-for-profit group right here in D.C., and I have some prepared comments. EPA, as part of the White House Task Force, has a duty to protect our nation's pollinators, and the Presidential Memorandum has directed EPA and other federal agencies to take action. This is an urgent need to move quickly on finding long-term sustainable solutions for pollinator protection. The average loss rate reported by U.S. beekeepers over the past eight years has been 29.6% well over the self-reported acceptable mortality rate, with some beekeepers reporting 90 to 100 percent losses. Additionally, a growing body of scientific evidence is showing connections between pollinator declines and pesticide exposure. As the agency is aware, the neonicotinoid class of systemic insecticides, as we know, is used for widely for bee treatments, has been identified as a main contributing factor in bee decline linked to impaired bee navigational and learning behavior, suppressed bee immune system, loss of queens, and death. In recognizing these adverse impacts on pollinators, the Fish and Wildlife Service has already issued a formal decision, generally phasing out by 2016 all munis used in agriculture on thousands of acres of national wildlife refuge land noting that prophylactic use of neonic pesticides can potentially affect a broad spectrum of non-target species. Similarly, the White House Council on Environmental Quality announced new guidelines for federal agencies to incorporate pollinator-friendly practices at federal facilities and on federal lands. Critical to pollinator health within these guidelines is a requirement the agency should acquire seeds and plants from nurseries that do not treat their plants with systemic insecticides. Further, the document states that chemical, chemical controls can, that can adversely affect pollinator populations should not be applied in pollinator habitats. This includes herbicides, broad spectrum contact, and systemic insecticides, and some fungicides. So in keeping with these positive steps to improve pollinator health um, given by Fish and Wildlife Service and the Council on Environmental Quality, we hope EPA will move forward expeditiously as possible on the following recommendations. We hope to see that EPA um, ensure that its assessments and all future ecological assessments fully value the broad array of ecosystem services threatened not only by neonics but by all systemic pesticides. We would like to see an increase in investment in research and funding for the implementation of alternatives to neonics and recommend incentives for farmers to create healthy pollinator habitats in the form of diversified pesticide-free landscapes as an alternative to our current system of intensive monoculture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ryan Craybill. I'm here today on behalf of the National Potato Council, where I serve as the Senior Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs. The NPC represents more than 90% of the approximately 6,000 potato growers in the United States, the vast majority of whom are farmers caring for land that has been in the family for generations. Nationwide, more than 1 million acres of potatoes are cultivated each year, yielding more than 40 billion pounds at a farm gate value of over $4 billion. Nearly 30% of the annual yield ends up in the produce section of grocery stores for fresh consumption. Most of the remaining crop is processed for consumption through freezing, chipping, canning, and dehydrating. About 6% of the crop is devoted to seed for the following year's crop. Overall, nearly 20% of the potatoes grown in the U.S. are destined for consumers overseas. 
The NPC is an active member of the EPA's Pesticide Environmental Stewardship Program and each year presents a grower with the Environmental Stewardship Award to recognize his or her efforts to improve the overall health of the environment. Although potatoes do not directly depend upon pollination for their successful cultivation and harvest, the health of, of pollinators can serve as a useful barometer of the health of the surrounding environment and therefore is of the utmost concern to potato growers. Put another way, pollinators are not only of significant importance to U.S. agriculture broadly, but also to the overall health of the ecosystems within which our growers work and live. We recognize the challenges faced in some areas with instances of declining beehive health. We are also pleased that over the past 50 years, there has been a significant increase in bee colonies across the globe. As underscored by the USDA's 2012 report on honeybee health, the issue of pollinator health is a complex one dependent upon a number of factors, many of which are being addressed by this task force. The report identified nutrition, parasites, pathogens, genetics, biology, and breeding, in addition to pesticides as issues affecting bee health. Many experts agree loss of habitat, suboptimal weather conditions, and hive management are additional adverse factors. Based on the extensive list of suspected stressors, we strongly urge members of the task force to continue to take a measured approach based on science over speculation and facts over fear. The decisions made by this task force will have real and lasting impacts and therefore must be made with the utmost care and responsibility. Complex issues rarely have silver bullet solutions. Our growers embrace the latest pest management technology and seek to use the smallest number and volume of inputs possible. Not surprisingly, integrated pest management programs are a key to the long-term health of the environment and growers' bottom line. A critical tool in our grower's IPM toolbox is the neonicotinoid class of pesticides, replacing older chemistries that over time have since been removed from that toolbox. Unfortunately, in some circles, neonicotinoids have been targeted as the primary reason for declining bee health instead of one of many. This conclusion seems to be at odds with EPA's reduced risk determination and current science, which point, points to a strong correlation between declining bee health and the presence of pests and disease like the varroa mite, among several other factors previously mentioned. We are concerned that undue attention to one specific stressor of many would result in a false sense of progress on our shared goal of improved pollinator health. We appreciate the extraordinary efforts of the Pollinator Health Task Force to address the broad set of challenges and concerns facing pollinators today, and thank you for your consideration of our comments. Are there any additional comments in the room? Hi, I'm Nicole Hamilton, and I'm a Monarch Watch Conservation Specialist, as well as the Executive Director for Loudoun Wildlife Conservancy. And I know that there are going to be a lot of um, pieces of input from Monarch Joint Venture and Monarch Watch at that high level, so I won't get into that. But the Monarch Butterfly is on your screen up there as one of these stakeholder insects, and we haven't talked about that yet. Um, the monarch butterfly population has declined by 90% um, since 1996. And it's one of those species that's iconic for our nation and really for our culture. It's one of those species that we as a society right now are responsible for making sure that it doesn't slip away. And we have that ability right now with this task force to really make a difference. So as you're moving forward, with the task force and looking at this different pollinator health uh, habitat, we ask that you also bring into the discussion the bringing back of milkweed. Milkweed is the only plant that monarch butterflies lay their eggs on. It's the only plant that the caterpillar eats. And so it's, it's at the crux of bringing back the monarch butterfly. I know a lot of these other points too around insecticides is critical to this as well. And I echo the words of the American Bird Conservancy and the Pollinator Partnership. Um, so I won't go into that, but I thought I'd share a little bit about what we're doing in Loudoun County, um, because in addition to this high-level activity that we're talking about, there's a really grassroots activity that's happening. And in Loudoun, back in 2012-2013, uh, we launched a campaign to bring back the monarch and keep the magic alive. And through that campaign, we brought together people across the county, across the region, to 
not only come out to learn about the monarch butterfly population and what was happening, but also to engage in activities like habitat restoration projects. And we've converted that into looking at some significant impacts that we could have with schools, with the business community in terms of developing partnerships with nurseries so that milkweed would be available, so that native non-pesticide um, or so pesticide-free plants would be available, and that people could actually go out and restore either their gardens or establish plantings in their HOAs and places like that. Another thing that we've done recently is started to strike up a partnership with VDOT. And through some initial conversations with VDOT to talk about the plight of the monarch and the pollinators, um, they were very receptive to the idea of looking at how that they can change their mowing practices. Simply by shifting their mowing schedule, they can actually provide habitat for the monarchs, for pollinators during the, the critical time periods that they have. So we provided them with some calendars of when to mow, when not to mow, and that would be really helpful. Um, if, if you go to the VDOT website, you'd also see a, a recent planting activity that we did with them. And we're looking at this also as a public outreach um, activity so that we can build that, that sort of understanding of why are medians not being mowed during the summertime? What's the benefit? And at the end of the day, the monarch butterfly is one of those species that we all recognize. I bet if I ask people in this room if you've ever seen a monarch butterfly, everyone would raise their hand. But if I ask that same question about, did you see one last year, I might not get that same response. So it's slipping away, but it's in our grasp to really make a change. Um, another really quick thing that we're doing is looking at those business partnerships. So Loudoun County has a very strong wine industry, and for those who enjoy going on wine trails, uh, we're throwing out the idea to some of the local growers around a wings and wine trail so that there can be some tourism brought together. Uh, we already have four vineyards that have created Monarch Way stations, and anything more than three is a trail, so we're, we've started. There's about 29 vineyards, and there are a lot of things that we can do um, just from Loudoun County, making that as a catalyst that can go to other places nationwide. Uh, we are very happy to share all of the information that we have um, and just let it go further. So thank you for this, this task force. Why don't we go back online, uh, Sarah McCabe? Sarah McCabe? And we'll go to uh, Don Studinsky. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, so I wanted to ask basically that the um, label issue on the systemic poisons, you alluded earlier to the, uh, the hole that you could drive a truck through. And, you know, from my perspective, it didn't take very long between the time that those label changes started being discussed and the time that we actually saw those labels uh, announced and implemented. I don't understand why it would not be a high priority to get that hole filled in, and, and I don't see why it would take very long to do so. If, if, we could, if we could create the hole in a short period of time, we should be able to close it in a short period of time. So that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sarah McCabe? Um, pound six, Ms. McCabe, and then we should be able to hear you. Okay, we'll, we'll circle back to her. She's, she's writing to us okay. in the webinar that she's trying to speak, but we're not hearing her. Um, Kathleen, uh, Kathleen, excuse me, Curtis.
Hello? Yes, go ahead. Oh, hi. Thanks for the opportunity to talk, and I appreciate you having this public meeting. Um, I am a backyard beekeeper on the Texas Gulf Coast. I'm a member of the Brazoria County Beekeepers Association, and I've, we've been following um, the program, uh, the federal program, with interest. And I noticed the Department of the Interior is working with right-of-way holders to manage those areas for pollinators on federal lands. And I think that's a great idea. And I think it could be expanded to private lands. In my personal experience, the managers of the pipeline right-of-way behind my house were very willing to change their mowing schedule to accommodate my bees. Instead of mowing four times a year, they agreed to mow only in February. So this month, my bees have an acre of asters and goldenrod, and I have seen wild bees, monarchs, and other butterflies back there, too. So thank you, Philip 66 and Louisiana Crane and Construction. And so I would like to suggest a public-private partnership between right-of-way holders and private landowners. Um, that would be rights-of-way for large power lines and for pipelines. So many of these rights of way go through farmland and pasture that could not be managed for pollinators. There is enough area within rights of ways that is not farmed to provide a significant part of the one million acres of habitat that is desired. Additionally, the rights of ways have the advantage of usually having no car traffic. The problem is coordinating the maintenance departments of rights of way holders with the millions of private landowners. In Texas, we are very proud of our native wildflowers. And I have observed that many of my neighbors would like to have more wildflowers on their property, but they don't have the expertise to choose species that will work in their local soil and climate conditions. It is possible that many private landowners would be enthusiastic about allowing rights-of-way owners to manage their land for pollinators if those companies acquired the expertise to maintain pollinator plants. The challenge would be to educate the public about this proposed program and to make it an industry best standard, best practice standard for the power and pipeline companies. And that's what I have to say, and thank you for the opportunity to talk. All right, thank you. Was that Kathleen Curtis who was just speaking? Sarah McCabe. Oh, Sarah McCabe. Okay, thank you. Um, Kathleen Curtis? Kathleen, I know you're trying to connect in. Um, try hitting pound six on your telephone. Okay, we'll 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 circle back to Kathleen. Um, I know I'm going to butcher this last name. I I apologize. Um, R. Matiniak. Okay, how do I sound? We can hear you. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, my name is Richard Martiniak. I am an entomologist, pest control operator, and a beekeeper. Uh, I work with the bee industry in Florida, um, and I'm associated with um, a firm that's uh, called Insect IQ and all FloridaBeeRemoval.com. And um, I would like to add to the, uh, the observations that I've heard. Um, I just want to thank everybody for participating in this. And I think it's very important and very helpful for everyone to help um, in this complex issue. Here in Florida, we have the uh, intrusion of the Africanized honeybee subspecies. And we have been... Um, recording its movement north in the state. Um, and you know, our observations are that this subspecies is a very uh, robust, I'd say healthy uh, bee. And it does, uh, it, it can, I don't know how exactly to say this, but we treat and remove these bees that get into homes and freeholds and many other spaces where they are very close to human proximity. They sting with a ferocity I'm sure that you've heard about. 
And um, what we have noted is that the number of colonies that are moving into the areas that were predominantly uh, European honeybee are increasing uh, yeah, at least by 10 to 20, if not 100 times the amounts that we've seen before based on our records over 20 years. And um, you know, at times we may attempt live removals and try to uh, put them in our existing quarantine yards. But mostly we terminate these colonies and we do use insecticides. And um, while we're not using neonicotinoids, we do use uh, cipronil for control of other insects that are in these spaces. And what I'd like to note is that we find uh, reinfestation by the honeybee uh, in many spaces where we've treated with cipronil. And uh, the only way we can really keep them out is by exclusion or by filling the void with a physical item, uh, such as insulation. And, uh, you know, my opinion is that, uh, you know, we, we are treating honeybees and maybe some other pollinators uh, with kid gloves. I think that they are, the wild bees are doing very well, at least in areas that are, provide forage and proper weather. Um, and, you know, the issue that we're seeing with um, bees that are kept in colonies uh, are largely this complex problem of um, that we've already noted. You know, fungicides that are have some lethal, lethal effects. Um, the fact that keeping any kind of animal um, and treating it can make it susceptible to uh, problems illnesses and that we don't see uh, in the wild uh, type. And, um, you know, that, that the main message here is to, as many others have stated, is that to treat this as a multivariate problem, that there are many issues that are affecting our bees that we kept, keep and most likely the native pollinators. Uh, it's not something simple. It's probably not something that we can point at like neonicotinoids, although they, of course, they probably figure into this whole equation. So let's, let's tread lightly with our opinions and uh, conclusions and continue the research and partnerships. For example, the forage partnerships is nothing but good. And, um, you know, just hold our, our conclusions back until we get more uh, research done. Thank you very much. I'm done. Thank you. Um, I think Kathleen Curtis may have her microphone ready, Ms. Curtis. So why don't we go to Mark Emrich. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name is Mark Emmerich. I'm president of the Washington State Beekeepers Association. And one thing that hasn't been touched on today uh, is the fact that um, a lot of the things that we have basically denoted as noxious weed um, are very, very medicinal for bees. Um, and I think we have to kind of take a proactive approach and take a look and see whether these noxious weeds um, are actually of negative value um, to um, the environment. Um, our bees, as all the beekeepers know, um, are all imported. Um, we don't have um, an American bee. Everything has been imported. And noxious weeds have been imported. Um, and we're starting to see articles coming out where there's actually medicinal use, uh, that bees can actually promote their health uh, by different uh, acids 
uh, and proteins that only these weeds produce. And so I think it's another thing that we have to visit, we have to take a look at, we have to be concerned with that um, in our zeal to make sure that our native plants aren't being overrun uh, by noxious weeds. We also have to realize that our pollinators uh, find great value in them. Um, found a lot in the propolis, which is uh, in uh, our hives, and uh, have some great value. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's try Kathleen Curtis one more time. Is any other commenters in the room here in Crystal City? Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name's uh, Jeff Pinkham. I'm with Scott's Miracle Grow. I was intrigued by the comments on public private partnerships, and I've heard a lot of good examples from people on the phone and people in the room. Um, that we would never considered. We have an initiative called Grow 1000, where we're putting in 1,000 gardens in cities throughout the United States. So I was wondering if EPA has or if they would consider sort of creating a single source of other public entities that we might be able to work with or if some of the existing public-private partnerships as well. That would be a great resource for us to use. Thank you. Were there any other comments in the room? Okay. Um, I see one more request. Uh, Kevin Hoyer. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Kevin Hoyer. I'm a farmer from Wisconsin, also uh, representing the American Soybean Association. Uh, not only do I farm, um, but I also am a certified pesticide applicator. I uh, also am certified to treat seed with uh, seed treatments and a certified crop advisor as well. Um, farm, farmers are looking to be as sustainable as possible in their operations. They also are looking at uh, being the stewards of the land to the best of their abilities and that means protecting the pollinators, the beneficial insects and other wildlife that um, that is around them. Uh, years back we used to use products like um, synthetic pyrethroids, organophosphates, carbamates um, as insect protection on our seeds dropped out of our planters which were very uh, very hazardous not only to uh, to the insects, but also to the applicators. With the newer technologies of using the neonicotoids, um, we've been able to apply that right onto the seed, reduce the exposure of um, these, uh, these chemicals to the applicators, to the environment, and to the beneficial um, wildlife that we, we wish to save. Um, it, it's, if, if we, take away these um, modern tools that we have, uh, we'd be forced to look back at some of the old practices that were highly unsustainable and did wreak havoc in our, in our environment. Uh, some of the research that has come out of the University of Wisconsin um, for the use of neonicotoids on seed treatments has shown that in uh, a four bushel um, benefit to the growers that are using them. Um, this may not be true in all cases because not every not every farm is the same, not every area of the country is the same. But here in the, in the northern growing regions, uh, we are planting in the very cold, wet soils where we have below ground insects such as wireworms, seed corn maggots um, that will attack the, the soybean seed and other seeds. And there's no rescue for that. Once we find that there is an infestation of these below-ground insects, uh, the only recourse is to replant. And, and in some cases, that opportunity to replant within the, um, in the window to 
to drive the most sustainability as we possibly can has been lost. Uh, without these tools, um, you're putting the, the the farmers that are growing the crops that are feeding the country, um, producing the fibers that we that we wear, producing the fuels that we we consume at a at a great financial risk. There's got to be a balance of protecting both our our pollinators and the sustainability of American agriculture. I urge the EPA to look at this with with a scientific view, looking at all aspects, and not to place a blanket um, decision across um, all of agriculture in the use of modern tools such as the neonicotinoids on our on our seeds. Uh, in, in closing, I just want to mention the uh, since I've been treating seeds. Um, the first seed treatments that came out that we were placing on our seeds were very dusty. Um, they did blow off. They were a health hazard. They were an environmental hazard. In recent years, the, the companies that are dealing in the seed treatments have made significant strides in providing polymers to, to, to keep the products tightly uh, attached to the seed during the planting period so that the the, the seed treatments that are on the seed actually do get into the ground, get, get covered by the soil to reduce the risk of unwanted uh, exposure to our beneficial insects. We need to continue looking at scientific um, uh, remedies for this so we don't lose the valuable tools to, to maintain the sustainability of our agricultural system. Thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you. Um, we have reached the end of our allotted time. Uh, I know there were a couple more people online that we weren't able to get to. I apologize. Um, we do have another listening session uh, next Monday, the 17th, from 1 to 3 p.m. Um, USDA will be hosting it at its uh, facility in Riverdale, Maryland. It's the APHIS facility. Um, information for that webinar and teleconferencing information will be available on the EPA website um, later today. We're finalizing the logistics for that meeting. Um, for those of you who would like to pre-register to um, give comments at Monday's meeting, you can send an email to uh, Joe Navola. His email address is Navola, which is spelled N as in Nancy, E, V as in Victor, O, L A dot Joseph at EPA dot gov and he he'll compile a list for us and that's where we will start um, on Monday afternoon and then we'll probably use a very similar format to what we use today. So thank you all for participating. I think we got a lot of interesting feedback to consider and we're looking forward to Monday session as well. Thank you.